Good morning, everybody, and hello from a very snowy London today. Welcome to you from wherever you are joining us. We have people joining in from all around the world. Welcome to this webinar on redesigning services around the citizen. I'm Siobhan Benita. I'm a former UK civil servant, and I'm chairing this webinar on behalf of the Global Government Forum, who is a publishing house that works with civil servants around the world. I'd also like to say a big thank you to our knowledge partner, IBM. Um, we have Paul from IBM with us today. So thank you very much for your support and for sharing your expertise with us today. So for years, civil servants have been working on trying to reform services so that they really work for the way citizens live their lives. And in particular, um, trying to get those moments, whether it's um, a birth or a bereavement, or whether you retire or starting up a new business, to get those services all connected so they work in an efficient way for the citizen. But that hasn't always proved so easy to do. It requires the use of new technologies. It requires data to be shared in ways that we haven't shared data before. And it requires government departments and their agencies to all work together um, in a closer and more effective way. And although we know where we want to get to on this, there are still some challenges remaining um, and still some barriers to overcome. So that's what we will be discussing today with our fantastic uh, panel. We have five panel members with us today. I will introduce each of them shortly. Um, after they have spoken, we will have a bit of a discussion, but actually there will also be time for you as the audience to send in your questions. So please, as you're listening to our panel members, you can use the Q&A function to send in any questions that you have, and we will get through as many of those questions as we can after the panelists have done their opening remarks. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our fantastic panel today. First, we will hear from Larry Harve. Larry is Managing Director for the e-residency program in Estonia, and he'll tell us a bit more about that innovative program that has helped startups and really revolutionized how things are being done in the country there. But Estonia is a, a world leader in kind of reforming its public services in general. And Larry has more than 20 years of private sector experience as well, working in the field of IT and FinTech before he's come to work um, with government. After Larry, we'll be hearing from Emmanuel Cuomo, I hope I've tried to pronounce that correctly, who is Chief Director in the Department of Public Service and Administration in South Africa. And he heads a program which translates as the People First Unit. It's the Batu Pili program. And the focus of that program is on the prof professionalization of public services. And Emmanuel has held senior positions in several government departments in South Africa, always with a focus on initiatives that help to improve service delivery to all communities. Then we will hear from Paul Dommel, who, as I mentioned in the introduction, is from our knowledge partner. And Paul is the Global Director for Tax, Health and Social Programs at IBM. And Paul has extensive experience working with governments around the world on improving and personalizing services for the citizen. Then we'll go to Stefan Verhulst for an academic um, perspective today. And Stefan is the co-founder and chief research and development officer at the Governance Laboratory in New York University. And the Governance Lab is focused on improving governance and ultimately public service delivery using advances in science and technology, especially including data and the collection of intelligence. Stefan has many hats. He's also chair of the Data for Children Collaborative with UNICEF and a member of an expert group to the European Commission on Business to Government Data Sharing. So it's really good to have Stefan with us. And last but by no means least, we'll hear from Alex Kuma, who is Project Product Manager at DWP Digital here in the UK's Department for Work and Pensions. And Alex leads on a portfolio of digital services that includes the, um, the leading Tell Us Once. It's one of the most recognized, I think, um, initiatives in this area. It's a tool to help bereaved citizens to notify government that somebody has died um, and they only have to do that once and then all the other services are joined up and we'll hear more about that. And as project leader, Alex is passionate about transforming services to ensure that people get the right support when they need it most. So I'm sure you'll agree, we've got a really fantastic panel there. I'm going to ask um, uh, Larry to begin with his presentation, but as I said, 
please, as you're listening to the presentations, please do think about the questions that you have and use the chat function to send them in. Larry, over to you. Thanks very much. Well, thank you. I'm really, really happy to be here. Actually, we probably don't need the first slide since you already so uh, well introduced uh, myself. So just maybe uh, briefly for the context of Estonia, um, um, it's a really small country, so probably many people don't know about it, but we really started on this uh, journey of digitalization of government services a proper 30 something years ago almost. And of course it was, it was built on two parts, like one part was our, we had a quite a strong sort of math and engineering um, area and also education in the country. But also it was built on part uh, on, the, on the mother of all invention, which is necessity, because we were just dirt poor and broke after having <laughs> broken free from the back Soviet Union. So we just could not afford a proper kind of paper-based bureaucracy. So we had to do everything digital. So, so today we're quite happy to say that there's 99% uh, of public services are available online to the citizens, but also to residents and also to e-residents as well. And there are currently, I think, two um, public services which are not available online, one of which is getting married and the other one is getting a divorce. And um, I don't know if we're happy to say this, but uh, there is also a plan to then uh, move one of those also to online sphere so that will leave only one uh, service which is not available online. And that one is, will be then getting, getting married because, of course, you'd want to see the happy couple and make sure that they are indeed a happy couple. So um, maybe moving forward to quickly... Um, introduce on the next slide um, the, the program that uh, I'm with and, and I'm leading. So um, a good six years back, we kind of found that, you know, sharing is caring. So why should we keep our good and, uh, and well-built uh, digital services only to ourselves and to the citizens of Estonia? So we started offering something which is called e-residency. So it means um, pretty much every uh, citizen of every country in the world um, provided, of course, that there is an Estonian embassy in that country because it's still a physical document that we need to uh, give out to the, to the person, basically can apply, apply to become an e-resident of Estonia and will receive uh, the same uh, strong digital identity uh, document and also um, access to um, all the Estonian e-services. Of course, some of them maybe make more sense if you live here, and, but some of them are uh, quite universally accessible. Um, so uh, typically what the residents do, if Maria, if you could uh, switch on the next slide. So what of course is quite universal is, is running a business. So for example, if someone wants to open a, a European Union based company and uh, then they wanna do it through Estonia, then they can become an e-resident and absolutely every service that is uh, relevant to a business to, to do a business transactions, to uh, buy or sell property or buy or sell shares or any other type of activity that you need to do as a business is available online, is available in, well, besides the local languages, of course, is also available in English. So you can pretty much do it yourself, um, even if you don't uh, speak the local uh, dialects uh, of which we have two here. So that's the program I'm with. And um, then maybe uh, going forward to the topic of the day uh, as the intro part is over. So today's, today's topic is all about designing or rather redesigning services around citizens' lives. Um, so we thought together with, uh, with the panel organizers, like what could these services be that we want to talk about. And um, uh, a couple of years back, actually two years back exactly, Estonia also started on this path of uh, reorganizing um, services around citizens' lives. Because many of the services that we had built, of course, they are they look like the persons who built them. So they are built by professionals for professionals. And if you happen not to be a professional, it could be quite complicated to use. So for example, maybe buying or selling a car is quite an easy transaction for a DMV clerk. But if you buy or sell a car once in five years, then all the vocabulary, the activities you need to do could be quite complicated for you actually. So, um, so Estonia analyzed about 200 such uh, services and then decided on 15, uh, which we wanted to overhaul, and then five of them already uh, more or less done, and 10 are still um, in progress. So one of such services that we decided to overhaul two years ago was registering a childbirth uh, after, after your child is born, that there are quite a lot of activities and quite a lot of processes you need to follow. Uh, so I remember back in the time when I was still a, a first-time young father, then I had to run around the town with all kinds of paperwork, going through processes which I did not quite understand, also a bit uh, sleep-deprived, and, and uh, my mind was frankly elsewhere. Um, so I was quite lucky that uh, 
I only I only made one mistake. So um, uh, my son is now called Marcus with a C instead of Marcus with a K, as it's more common in this uh, part of the world. But today the process looks very, very different. Uh, literally last year, March, and it was a little bit fueled by COVID as well, in the sense that it was a plan to overhaul this process. But then, of course, uh, with, the, with the COVID restrictions, some things got a really good boost. So, so literally from last year, March, um, after you have um, you have a child, child is born, basically, then the parents can go online to do um, all the registration and, and all the kind of giving the names, uh, the, the first name and also uh, surname options to the child, then registering for all kinds of benefits um, and also um, accepting paternity on the father's side. All of this now happens as, as one process, fully online, and, um, and this is quite easy to use and is designed around the person uh, that is dealing with it. Also, keeping in mind, of course, that uh, you know, uh, dealing with paperwork after, after childbirth is probably not the sort of uh, first, uh, first choice of activity. So this has, has worked really well. And of course, then going a little bit further into the future, there are also plans to actually bring this even further upstream so that uh, also registering already pregnancy and, uh, and things that different activities you need to do from there on to the childbirth, that they would also be part of the same journey. Uh, this is coming online later this year. Thank you so much, Larry. I, I, um, so two things there. One, I really like the fact that you're working for a program, the e-residency program that shows not only can it help citizens that live in, in Estonia to people beyond Estonia so that those services can help um, regardless of the country that you're in. But I, I love the example you give there of how those moments when you really need it most, they're sleep deprived parents, um, what you really need is government to come in and help you and make it as streamlined and efficient as um, possible. And I hope your wife forgave you for the spelling mistake um, <laughs> there <Yeah>. as well. <laughs> so thank you so much. I can see we're always get, already getting some questions coming in, which is great. Some of those are around um, inclusion and we'll definitely pick that up. I'm sure that's a topic that will come up um, more throughout the presentations. We'll pick that up in the discussion afterwards. Emmanuel, over to you, thank you. Thank you, uh, Shoben and Maria. Thanks for organizing this uh, panel. And let me also welcome or rather greet uh, all the panelists. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this uh, webinar today. And I hope we will be able to learn from uh, one another. Um, most of you will know South Africa. We are at the southern tip of Africa. Um, it's been uh, quite a roller coaster since 1994 of having to overhaul a lot of uh, policies, uh, legislations, etc. One of those was uh, coming up with a legislation that will uh, direct the, the uh, government to ensure that we are citizen focused. Uh, prior to 1994, government was not so much uh, citizen focused. It was rules-based. Uh, after that, we are more citizen-focused. Uh, we have a policy, which is part of a white paper policy called Batupili. Now, this one is more about focusing services to people. It's 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 forcing government to be uh, citizen-centric. Uh, one of the uh, aims, of course, of it was to introduce a new approach to service delivery which pe puts people first or people at the center of planning and also of uh, delivering services. It's also about improving the face of service delivery by uh, fostering new attitudes, such as increased commitment, personal sacrifice, dedication, et cetera. Uh, all of this, we also want to ensure that the image of the public service is improved and the public can see the public service as an employer of choice. Uh, now, Batupili as a policy was launched in 1997. Uh, in 2004, uh, there was a review and there's the whole, sorry, uh, Maria, uh, I'm, I'm going to be talking to the slide, but also uh, putting in some of the information that may not be there. So let's go to the second slide. I think, yeah, because it's giving a bit of background. Uh, 2004, we had a revitalization strategy, and now we are in the process of renewing that revitalization strategy. Um, as government, 
we have a, a medium term strategic framework and a program of action that we ensure that is responsive uh, to people's needs. Uh, it shows you know, the efficient and effective and development oriented public service. We, through this MTSF, uh, which is informed by constitutional imperatives uh, through our constitution, uh, the various chapters that I'm mentioning there are actually giving the uh, government that mandate to enforce a new strategy. Let's go to the next slide. With a new strategy, as we want to renew the strategy, we have four pillars. Uh, the first pillar is about taking the lead. We're saying that as government, uh, the leadership as well as officials, we must take the lead. Uh, in taking the lead, we include, of course, the communities. So whatever programs that must be given or that must be delivered, whatever services that have to be uh, uh, delivered, government must take the lead, but together with, with the people. There must be a fostering of understanding and, con and conviction. Uh, that's the second pillar. There should be a development focus. Uh, that will be the third pillar. And the last pillar is reinforcement. Reinforcement would include actions that would help us to ensure that as we improve uh, implementation of services, uh, public servants themselves are empowered. Uh, they are skilled in the right way, but we also have the right tools. Uh, marketing the program is efficient. And of course, given the COVID now, the COVID situation, we have to be innovative as well. All of these pillars are held together by a behavioral change program, uh, which is the Batupele program. The focus now is on public servants changing our behavior. Uh, it, it's not an easy thing, but we're saying put people first. Whenever we enter into our offices, whenever we think of providing any service, the first thing is, is it of benefit to the people who are who's supposed to receive that, that, that service? And so the programs that we're putting in place have to be also in line. The next slide, please. Uh, this is just a log frame. We start with the constitution, which, which gives us the mandate. I uh, showed you the pillars. The pillars would then give a rise to activities. We have to come up with certain activities and I explain those in, in, in my slides and in the next slide. And then what would be the mode of delivering those activities or, or providing those services? We look at that and then we look at what are the envisaged outcomes. Uh, and then of course, the last part is the impact. What impact do we have on society? Whatever activities that we have, they, they must have an impact on society. And then the last slide, this is the slide which explains now, it gives all those, the pillars, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the activities, uh, I want to emphasize uh, around the activities as we professionalize the public service, uh, pillar three uh, on development. We also link that to pillar one of taking the lead where social impact, uh, rather, rather compact uh, are seen as important. We need to have this social compact with communities. Uh, through various means. One is to have service delivery forums or community development forum where we engage directly with communities and everybody across society would be part of those fora. Uh, the mode of, 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 of delivery, uh, I want just to emphasize around the communication. How do people then know that we are actually engaging on various programs and when are we reaching them, et cetera. There is an elaborate uh, communication mechanism that government has, has outlaid through our uh, central government, uh, uh, the communi government communications uh, uh, information system, which reaches up to the rural areas. But we also use all forms of media. Um, it could be social media, uh, broadcasting, uh, TV, radios, et cetera. We use all of those. Uh, we also use uh, targeted uh, uh, exhibitions where we go into a community, there would be an exhibition held where government departments bring their services, et cetera, to say, this is now what, what we are doing. So in a nutshell, 
this is the uh, the log frame and the aim of this Batupili program is to ensure that government brings services and appropriate services to the communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. And it's interesting that both Larry and yourself started off by talking about the political context that's driven the kind of changes, driven the reforms in different ways. And actually, although each country's on different stages of those journeys, I think a lot of the topics you mentioned there, the importance of leadership, the importance of getting the civil servants and the people who are developing these policies to think differently and to include the users in the development, so the communication with communities, are things that I think all countries and all civil servants um, can relate to. And then finally, you obviously mentioned COVID, and I think we'll come back to that in the discussion as well, because that's also obviously something that everybody's going through now, which is also driving changes in the way public services are delivered. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Paul, I'm going to come to you next. Okay, thanks, Shaban. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this. Uh, it's an incredible panel, and I'm really pleased to be part of it. The other thing is, you know, I'm on video conferences all day long, every day, uh, but it still amazes me that, um, you know, that Emmanuel's from, from, from South Africa, and, uh, it, and Larry is from Estonia. Those are countries that are not close and that we can all be together to have a conversation. So I'm going to talk about um, the trends and technology around citizens um, and designing services around citizens' lives. I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact. Uh, and then I'm just going to touch on uh, some of the things that um, I think make for a successful project. So uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, I think there, there are some key directions and we all see them, uh, particularly I think in the light of COVID where all of a sudden artificial intelligence and virtual assistance, the ability to get information um, online in ways that we'd never gotten it before to have questions answered, to not have to call into a call center have been, um, have been really, really big and really important. Collaborating around citizens' needs, we've um, increasingly seen clients that are working with really vulnerable citizens and populations to, to bring government services around the individual. And I, just as an example, uh, you know, maybe somebody coming out of prison um, through COVID and early release uh, because of COVID may struggle with um, mental health issues. They are gonna have a, potentially have a hard time with housing, with employment. Uh, they have to work with parole, mental health. So all these different things. Um, and increasingly we've got clients that are interested in allowing all of those different caseworkers and the person coming out of prison to be part of planning their own services and to be able to collaborate, to see what each other are doing and deliver services to that individual. And lastly, there's an, a ton of work that's starting to happen because of the, the pace and the capability to um, personalize services directly for an individual. So um, as an example, we're doing some uh, work to transition people from the military to civilian world. Um, you know, some of those people have issues with post-traumatic stress syndrome, have a lot of different issues, and able to combine um, some uh, things for mental fitness with job search, with um, a community of people that are in the same position that they are. Underlying all of this stuff is the ability to automate um, and even paper processing um, is starting to move to move faster and we can automate, capture images, use artificial intelligence to even understand handwriting um, and to, to get processes done fast. Um, data is big and there's nothing more important than good design, obviously than uh, good design. So if we go to the next slide, just to give you a little bit of examples of some of this. So in the artificial intelligence and process automation world, 35% um, fewer calls to a call center as a result of people being able to go online and get the answers to questions that they have or to get sent to a link to help them to complete an application. Um, that has real value in terms of allowing um, a, 
finite number of resources, which is us, which is people on the line, people working with citizens to be able to spend more time on complicated issues and not the easy stuff. Um, in, we're working with a, with a client on uh, paper benefit applications. So it takes about 30 days. There's still, you know, as much as we try to do online, um, there's still uh, people that submit applications online. So in that process takes maybe 30 days, uh, 15 to 30 days to get through a process of send the application in, get it, uh, fill it out, goes into a mail room, gets routed around via mail from office to office. We've really been able to work to automate that process, capture the images, use some artificial intelligence to make sure we get it right, some business rules, and take that process from 30 minute, 30, 30 days to 30 minutes, um, which has huge impact both on citizens and on um, and on people in the government. So in this particular project, you know, more than 300 people have been allowed to be reassigned to higher value services than you know, opening up mail, reading applications and routing them. Um, in terms of online uh, and collaboration, I talked a little bit about what clients are doing with vulnerable citizens and I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. Um, but on personalization and uh, life transitions, you know, these, um, if you can develop a solution that's really personalized to an individual, um, we've been able to, um, just in piloting with 1,500 veterans, that 14% of them actually use the, an app to find a job. Uh, the amount of time that they spend on the app is uh, 13 minutes a day. Uh, if you can design things well, then they use it, uh, want to use it, and get the benefits out of it. And I think it's, it's an, a, an example and really kind of a humbling example of good design that there's a group of these veterans that were using the tool um, and, and they use that to contact sort of a mental health and suicide hotline. And there were four of them of these 1500 people that use that tool to connect with the hotline uh, multiple times. So um, real impact on, uh, on technology. So if we go to the, uh, to the next slide, as I was telling the, the panel before we got on, um, my boss is not on, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw, throw something out that technology is not everything. And I'm going to give an example of how three agencies gather documents to prove um, you know, required to, to receive it for an individual to receive a service. So in the first agency, there's a mobile submission. 80% of, of um, in New York City for um, SNAP, which is a food program, applications come online uh, via mobile device. Really cool, really slick. Um, and there is an issue with errors uh, and they're working on making the, the, you know, the documents that come in by taking a picture with your phone. Uh, and they're working on smoothing that out. Another citizen, another, um, another agency um, feels like we want to best serve citizens. We don't want to frustrate them with errors in the document collection process. So we'd like to, them to come into the office so that we can, and we think we can resolve 99% of the issues right there in the office if they bring all their stuff and we get exactly what we need. The third agency in New Delhi has a completely different look. It's a doorstep service where in New Delhi, there are about 50 different citizen services where an individual will come out, go to your house, meet with you, collect the documentation that's required and come back, uh, do the work, and then go back to your, go back to your house and issue, uh, issue the license or uh, provide the benefit. So three, three, three different ways of doing that. And I, if we go to the next slide, um, when we think about citizen services, I think it's really important that we frame the challenge, right? Um, you know, the challenge in, uh, in, New, in New Delhi is not the same as uh, working with citizens in, in New York City. You know, the, the labor world is different, the technology and infrastructure world is different. Critical to build trust. Um, you know, I, I worked in government before coming to IBM, and I guess I've still got a good 
uh, a good government hat on, but it's incredibly important to measure where you were before and to measure the results. And, and I think if nothing else, um, these projects are increasingly successful, increasingly close to 100% of the time. And we need to be able to articulate the value that we're getting and we're delivering to citizens by doing that. And lastly, Emmanuel did a really good job of laying out um, the so, sort of the political and the legal and constitutional um, framework. But you know, all these things are really important as well as the, the change management. But, but it's really building trust, building trust between the team and between the that's delivering that may come from lots of different places and the citizens that are receiving it. And they really need to be part of the process of designing services. Thank you so much, Paul. So again, I mean, you highlighted there really well, if we can get this right with good design, like automation, not only can you simplify services and really, you know, you mentioned they're bringing together things like employment, mental health support benefits, all of those kind of things, but also do it at pace. So your, your example of going from 30 days, I think 30 days to 30 minutes, a really incredible example there. But also some key issues which we'll pick up on the discussion which have already been raised about that need for trust between government and the citizens, really important. And also I like what you said, it's not a one size fits all. So although we're all trying to get to better services, that's gonna look different, I think, depending on, on what your users are used to, what the culture is already in place. Um, and that's really important factor to take in as well. Thanks so much. Stefan, I'm going to come over to you in New York. Over to you. Thanks so much, Siobhan, and a uh, pleasure to be here and a pleasure to join this uh, distinguished panel. And so, uh, as mentioned, I'm Stefan Verhulst. I'm the co-founder of GovLab, and we are an action research center based here in New York. We are part of New York University. And our focus, and next slide, please, our focus is to really focus on how do we innovate in how we make decisions? And of course, within the context of today, uh, quite often we're looking into how do we innovate and in how we provide new services, more citizen-centric service. And basically what we are looking at is how do we level two, how do we lever two important assets that really are at the heart of how we can transform the way we make decisions in order to improve the way we go about providing services. And those two assets are on the one hand data, and obviously in order to leverage data, you do need to have an investment in a variety of data science methodologies, including of course, more and more artificial intelligence. And the other asset that we are looking at is people. And how do we leverage people and their input, their expertise in new ways in order to improve the way we go about designing services. And that's where what we call, uh, that's where we need uh, the use of collective intelligence. And so on the one hand, collective intelligence, and on the other hand, artificial intelligence are actually the methods that you can leverage in the 21st century in order to go about making decisions uh, that could impact citizen services in a new way. Now, both have challenges. Uh, on the data side and the artificial intelligence side, obviously there's a challenge of trust, there's a challenge of to what extent is the data representative, accurate and so on. And on the people side, there are a huge amount of transaction costs uh, to actually engage with people in a meaningful way, uh, to leverage their input, to leverage their expertise, to co-design. It doesn't scale that well. And so what we have been focused on is how do we actually combine collective intelligence and artificial intelligence in new ways to provide what I call augmented collective intelligence that can improve the way we engage people, the way we leverage data in order to provide for new services that are addressing citizens' needs in a far more targeted, but also people-centric uh, way. Next slide. So for the last few uh, months and years, we've been uh, doing a whole range of what I call observatory research, i.e. what is actually happening in the space. And these are just two uh, examples of products and articles. I mean, I'm an academic, as Chauvin said. So what we do is basically, in addition to helping quite often government officials as an action research center, we of course share that uh, through uh, reports and articles. And these are just two and happy to share the uh, links afterwards. But what we have identified, next slide, is that augmented uh, 
in, uh, augmented collective intelligence really can provide value in four kinds of new ways. One is what we call improving cognitive insight, which to a large extent is almost like what I would call focus groups of steroids. How do we actually a, engage more people in focus groups, but also how do we make sense almost in real time what those focus groups deliver so that you actually deal with a far better cognitive insight on what are the needs, what are the preferences. Second type of applications for augmented uh, collective intelligence is really to test out, again, uh, in a far more agile and uh, data-driven way, what are people's experiences, what are their preferences and how if we tweak X and, uh, a few kinds of aspects, how do those experiences and levels of satisfaction, how does that change over time? Third kind of area, and I will give examples in each of them, third kind of area is really about sensing and how do we make more uh, sense of actually the input. Uh, many on this call and many in the, in the audience uh, probably have uh, done public consultations and public consultations quite often takes uh, several months to actually then understand what is actually the signal that we got from those public consultations. And if we use augmented collective intelligence, we can actually see the signal in real time. And as a result, have a much better way to understand what are uh, the, um, uh, the positions that are uh, emerging and how do we actually cross those positions, developing services to actually meet those different needs. And then of course, what uh, again, Paul and others have talked about, we can also use augmented collective intelligence to really uh, professionalize, uh, uh, personalize uh, service delivery and ultimately scale up the capabilities of public authorities uh, in order to really use data with public input in order to triage, for instance, certain kinds of service uh, provisions that we have. And so just a few examples, and I go quickly because I realize we don't have that much time. Next slide. An example of how uh, we can actually use uh, augmented uh, uh, collective intelligence in order to uh, develop cognitive insight is an example that we've developed here uh, over the summer uh, together uh, with a few, uh, uh, with actually the public uh, um, libraries in New York, where we, are where we use the platform uh, in order to get uh, people's perceptions and their level of comfort in how we use data uh, in New York City to respond to COVID-19. And so this was basically uh, what we called a mini, a series of mini publics where we used artificial intelligence in real time to actually uh, change the way we engaged with audiences to really get a sense of what do people really think about the use of data in order to uh, use COVID-19. And this led to then insights that uh, uh, New York City uh, is leveraging to shape and design their approach to actually using data to inform the recovery uh, that is currently uh, focused on uh, uh, within COVID-19. So that's one example. The next example is an example uh, that is already a few years old, but this is an example of the immigration department here in the US where they also used artificial intelligence to fuel um, uh, input with regard to citizens' expectations in developing a new uh, uh, platform to, uh, for instance, um, applying for passports. And then subsequently, you could also triage actually how you engage with citizens in the way they've provided input to a large extent. And this is, again, some kind of user experience, user research on steroids where you uh, have an immediate insight and then you can also actually change the way you ask questions based upon the insight you get and, and, the, and, and the group uh, intelligence that is emerging. Next slide is then an example uh, where, for instance, the Camden Resident in Index, again, is already a few years old. And this is also where IBM, I guess, played a role where they actually connected people's input combine it with data that existed about the individuals in order to provide an index of actually individuals that might require different kinds of services that are being provided within Camden. And next slide is another example, and this is from Taiwan, where they actually used artificial intelligence 
almost in real time during a public consultation. I think this one was around Uber and, uh, and how they should uh, uh, regulate and legislate Uber services. And this was a, uh, a, a um, machine learning driven sense making to actually see the positions that people are taking almost in real time so that you then could actually uh, bridge uh, those positions uh, by engaging those con constituencies. And this is uh, using a platform called Polis. So these are just a few examples of, uh, next slide, augmented uh, intelligence. And so a few key takeaways is that while we have those examples, this is not the default yet, right? Still, we have public engagement basically as it was done in the 20th, in some, ca some cases, 19th century. So we really need to invest in um, how do we become more augmented in how we engage, how we develop collective intelligence programs. We need to also put greater emphasis on the pre and post launch of those initiatives. We need to anticipate risks. We especially need to anticipate bias because quite often the ones that are showing up for those kinds of engagement are not fully representative. And as a result, you actually embed bias in then the analysis. And you also need to focus on really ongoing incentives for actually providing collective intelligence moving forward. And of course, we need to not only generate insight, we need to actually act upon the insight. Too often we see all those consultations happening, all those experience uh, um, tests happening, and then nothing happens. <laughs> uh, you basically don't have it a strategy to that into actually retooling and ad addressing those kinds of needs. And we need methodologies because to a large extent, we have a bit of a gadget mentality here. Oh, this is another new uh, platform. Let's try this one out. But how do we actually become more sophisticated to embed that in the business process? Next slide is a view of the methodology that we have developed. I'm not going to go into detail there, otherwise uh, Siobhan will be getting very <laughs> <Give me up. laughs> And so last slide is uh, basically that we need uh, as a community really develop in an observatory of what is happening so that we actually learn from different practices across the ecosystem. And today is a great opportunity to actually start that observatory of what is really happening. We need to then have a way to rank the different tools and practices so that we are becoming more sophisticated. Actually, what are the strengths and weaknesses of different offerings? And ultimately, we really need to build that community of practice and expertise around augmented uh, collective intelligence so that we really go beyond uh, this constant politicization that we are currently seeing and, and embedding augmented collective intelligence as the default practice moving forward in how we engage citizens and uh, collect uh, collective intelligence in a more augmented way. So with that, Shobana, I'm gonna stop here. Thank you. Uh, if you want, uh, you can reach out afterwards. I'm eager to learn from uh, any practice that uh, we have missed in our observatory so far. Brilliant, thank you so much, Stefan. What's really interesting there is obviously we've been talking about the need for public services to be much more centered around the citizen. And it had never occurred to me that actually, how do you make sure that you are understanding the citizen's needs correctly? And it's fascinating to hear what you're doing, how you're applying the use of technology and data, um, artificial intelligence to actually get those insights into what the public actually want and what they're actually thinking. So that's a really bringing in that different perspective, really good. And I've noticed somebody in the Q and A, which thank you, Larry, you've already, answered was talking about, is there a repository where we can share good practice around these kind of things globally? Um, and it's nice to know that is starting. So I think that's one benefit of these kind of webinars. So last, but very much not least, I'm going to ask Alex to um, give his presentation, then we'll open up for the great questions we've had coming in. Over to you, Alex. Thanks, Siobhan. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for the opportunity to come and present today. Um, looking forward to the discussions afterwards. Um, I'm going to just take a, a quick run through um, a good example of what I think is a, is a service which is centred around users' lives in the UK. Um, it's been around for a while called the Tell Us Once service and some of uh, our panellists or, or, or the people on the call may well be familiar with it already. Um, so we'll just do that very quickly. So next slide, please, Maria. 
So just cycling back through history, where it all started, there was a, a public report that was produced in 2006. And, and in effect, it, it found out some stuff kind of in line with what we're talking about today, that quite often our citizens have to tell government several different occasions um, if a piece of their information changes or uh, in respect of a change of circumstances. And, you know, it's it's not it's it's quite obvious to suggest that um, if we try to rationalise that and, and uh, create our services around those life events, so people only have to tell government once that that would make a big difference a positive impact both in terms of the citizens user experience but also to taxpayers and ultimately to government as well um, it the suggestion was that you know we could do that through single points of contact and there were three specific um, sort of uh, areas that were identified as, as potential opportunities in respect of uh, reporting a death reporting a birth or a change of address and as a result of that paper um, tell us once a cross government program was was launched and um, led by the department for work and pensions which is where i work and, and it looked at developing such a service so i'll take you through how we did that next slide please so um, in 2009, uh, a vision was created for the service. And just to paraphrase what I think that vision means, in effect, following a life event such as a birth or a death, citizens know uh, that they need to tell government about that change. So that awareness is all important. But they also know how to tell government and trust that government is going to take the necessary actions once that, that change is reported. Next slide, please. So. There's some initial pilots that tested a different approaches as to how that might work. Following the success of those pilots, Tell Us Once launched nationally in 2011 for births and for deaths. Um, probably lots of reasons why um, the address element um, wasn't picked up. Probably don't have the time to go into that just yet, but maybe it's at the end of the session we might be able to. Um, and initially, that service was available to citizens through their local registrar, which is a service which is provided by all local authorities around the UK. But it was also available as a telephony service for those who needed to report a death. So there were two principal challenge, uh, channels um, at, at the initial launch. That was soon after followed um, through an online digital channel in 2012 2013 and that offered citizens the option to provide additional relevant information what we call data enrichment really at a time and at a place that suited them next slide please so the system, the service, it's been around for you know the best part of 10 years now. It's grown and it's gone from strength to strength in that time. We've won numerous rewards, and I think it still probably represents one of the best examples of cross-collaboration, certainly in UK government, when it comes to redesigning services around uh, life events. So just to give you some high-level um, sort of highlights here, um, Recently, uh, we achieved 100% population coverage across England, Scotland and Wales. That means that every single local authority uh, in Great Britain offers the service. So that's 397 local authorities. It covers five key government departments. Um, and it also includes other elements such as uh, national pension schemes, four of those, 89 local government pension schemes and two, over two and a half thousand registrars. Next slide, please. So in, in 2020, really, really interesting year for lots of reasons, but primarily for COVID reasons as much as anything. Um, some high level stats here for you. So there were over 670,000 deaths in England, Wales and Scotland and 459,615 of those were reported through Tell Us Once. So I should I should mention that the service is, is voluntary. Uh, citizens don't have to report enriched data through Tell Us Once, but I think many of them recognise that the benefits that that brings to them, given that it means that they can own, they only need to tell government once about a, a death. Um, so a good proportion of those deaths were reported through the service and there's a one to many relationship. So in terms of for every uh, death which is reported through Tell Us Once, more often than not, there are multiple notifications that will get sent out to different third party recipients. So the likes of different government departments and different local authorities, as I mentioned. And so there's a one to many relationship there. So for the 459,000 deaths that we received, there were over three million individual death notifications that were issued as, as a result of that. 
and if we look at the the, the ways and the channels that people opted to use to report the, that information, and um, you can see the breakdown on the screen there. So um, around about 68% of the deaths were reported online um, versus about 17%, which is a face-to-face -face channel, and then 15% as a telephony channel. I think as the year has progressed and as we've moved into 2021, um, that's changed again. And I think that's COVID driving people's behaviors. We've seen a greater shift towards online reporting of the information and online death uh, enriched data being reported and that's mainly because people feel, probably feel more comfortable um, we're, you know doing that from home but also the opportunities for face-to-face -face are obviously limited as well in, in a lockdown situation next slide please um, you know, but despite the the age of the service, and I suppose in in, in digital terms, it, it's it's um, quite a mature service now. Um, we still recognise the need for for continuous improvement, and that's something that we never really want to lose sight on. Um, so in 2020, the digital team delivered probably the biggest code changes on the service since it, it's launched, and and that really is a reflection of the the ambition to make sure that we keep improving and maintaining that service. Um, two principal big changes that happened, the first of which was a, a, a replatforming of the service. That was to remove a lot of technical debt, which was kind of slowing the team down when it came to making those continuous improvements. Uh, it also improved the reliability and the resilience of the service. Now, clearly, um, especially during the COVID era, a, a service such as Tell Us Once needs to be there 24-7. You know, we, to, we need to really limit the downtime. And in the event of a, of a major or serious incident, we want to be able to prove that the disaster recovery of that service is really quick and seamless. So that was one of the major bonuses of doing that uh, replatforming and that removal of that tech debt. That paved the way for us to do more changes to the service. And a good example of that is, is the um, citizen facing journey, which was really overhauled just back in November of last year. And that was to ensure compliance with the latest government accessibility standards. So as part of UK government, um, we're mandated to ensure that our online digital services are accessible people with accessibility needs. So that could be people who are using services, um, being assisted by certain devices um, as a result of a visual or a cognitive impairment, for example. And we need to make sure that our services work with those devices to give those people the best opportunity to be able to come and use our services. Um, there are, of course, assisted digital channels that support our Tell Us Want service as well through telephony and face-to-face. But I think you know we we want to focus on making sure that our online offering is as accessible as possible. So we did a, a complete overhaul of the the, the citizen facing journey just recently, and um, that included uh, updating the branding to be more consistent with the gov.uk branding that you may um, have seen before. Um, and it's obviously to make it uh, as usable as possible, not just for people with accessibility needs, but for all of our users. Um, so, so that's one um, kind of the, the very quick summary and, and run through of Tell Us Once. Um, the last slide um, really is just a, a bit of a, a, an underlying sentiment to this. And I think, you know, it's an example where really it's about government doing the hard work behind the scenes to make it simple for our users. So if we can overcome all of the political barriers, all the technology barriers and, and the people barriers really, because often when it's organizations to work that, that are working together, um, it's people and politics that kind of gets in the way more than mm -hmm. the technology. Um, but it's about doing the hard work to try and make it simple for the users. So ultimately, when it comes to that really key life event for them, uh, particularly in the context of a bereavement, that it's very simply laid out for them in terms of what they need to do. Thank you so much, Alex. So I think that's a real success story there from the UK. It's nice to have had those concrete examples from all of our panel members there, but um, uh, also I think showing the need for continuous improvement. So just because you've done it once, obviously with technology as well, you need to keep reforming that and keep making sure it's working for the users as well. And uh, I mean, one issue that I think other people touched on is, is how the pandemic has probably forced users who've maybe never thought of getting their services digitally to do that for the first time. That might be a legacy maybe that we can build on coming out of what's been a very dark uh, period for everybody. I want to start by picking up, we've had lots of questions in. So this was a question I was going to ask anyway, but it's come up in several of the questions about the, the risk here, hearing all these fantastic examples though, the risk of digital exclusion. So are we moving to developing new ways of delivering these services online, but for a host of reasons, they might not be ideal for certain members of the public. And I want to pick up on a couple of the questions that have come in. 
Um, you touched on, Alex, there, the idea of accessibility maybe for disability reasons. So people have asked the panel members if they could say a bit about that, to what extent is disability factored in? Um, but also other aspects, which maybe Emmanuel, somebody's mentioned in there also access issues. So it might be if you're going out to remote areas, is the infrastructure even in place so that everybody can access these services? Um, and culture change. So there might be some reasons why people don't want to take part in these services. They don't want to become visible. They don't want their data to be known, for example. And also, is there a culture change needed in the people delivering these services? And Emmanuel, again, somebody's asked, you talked a lot about behavior change. To what extent is the behavior of the frontline deliverers also an issue in terms of getting these um, services as widely as possible. So I'm gonna to come to each of you. Larry, I wouldn't normally do the same order again, but it seemed a long time since we've heard from you. So I'm gonna come back to Larry, your thoughts on inclusion and how we can make these new services as inclusive as possible. Yeah, I've, I've been reading the questions with, with one eye here as well, of course, and, uh, and then they do um, kind of circle around uh, topics of access and, and also people with disabilities. So in terms of access, I think there's really, really not something you can solve at the time when you're building the service. It's something you need to solve for before, unfortunately. And uh, also in a country where we thought that we are like really well, like a really digital nation and everybody has access to everything. And, and then suddenly, of course, COVID happened <clears throat> and suddenly every child needed a personal computer. And uh, even if there was a computer in the household, you suddenly realize that there wasn't four computers in the household. So it was uh, it was really heartwarming to see the, how the community came together and then and, and solutions were found and companies were donating uh, used computers and whatnot to make sure that people really um, uh, could afford or could could uh, solve these access issues in terms of technology. So literally, I would say there is no shortcuts to this. You kind of have to invest into both the rural access, but also uh, um, public computers and these things uh, in the past were more more of a norm uh, here as well. So so there's you cannot solve it at the, at the, at the solution uh, building level. You have to solve for it before. It's an infrastructure issue basically. Um, we have done pretty well on this, of course, but the, you know if you if it's not solved, then then unfortunately you have to go and solve the infrastructure issue first. In um, Estonia, you don't have such an issue of trust, do you? There's not an issue that people don't want to engage. You have very high levels of trust. Exactly, exactly. That's true. Uh, we are lucky in that sense, I suppose. And then when it comes to disabilities, then I, I think if you a little bit zoom out of this topic and think also people have um, uh, movability disabilities, they can't move around, they can't maybe drive a car, they can't take a bus. For them, all these digital services are quite a blessing, mm -hmm. right? So, so of course, there are, there are disabilities which uh, would limit you from using uh, online services. Um, of course, there are screen readers and other applications like that. We have a bit of a problem with this because we have a very small uh, language. So uh, usually international screen reading tools, they're not very uh, apt at small languages. They, they work generally pretty good with English and German and, and, and other sort of bigger languages. But that, that is definitely an issue. Um, okay, Thank, thanks very much, Larry. Emmanuel, I'm going to come over to you. What would you say the biggest issues for you are in terms of inclusion, making sure everybody can engage? Uh, thank you, uh, Shibon. I think for me, there are several things. For inclusion, for example, uh, without repeating what uh, Larry said, the issue of capacity building is important. Uh, the officials that are providing services need to be capacitated uh, properly and fully. Uh, they need to have tools of trade, uh, especially those working in rural areas, Besides connectivity and challenges of uh, broadband, people need to have uh, proper tools of trade, the laptops, access to telephones, etc., to be able to help their communities out there. Second, uh, thirdly, rather, uh, issue of distance. Uh, how far have they to travel to ensure that they bring those services, especially for communities that do not have online services? So uh, distance should be uh, taken care of, primarily by government providing resources uh, and, and or even short circuiting uh, the distances they have to cover. We have in, the, in, in our country, the community development workers uh, who are all around us on development issues. And each municipality has got a number that's commensurate 
uh, with the number of wards in that municipality. So you use such people to move around and help people uh, uh, with resources. So in a nutshell, I would say those are some of the things that uh, a government should do to, to, to mitigate the, the social, uh, this exclusion issue. Thank you. Thanks, Emmanuel. Stefan, I'm going to ask you, do you have any insights of maybe why people um, might feel excluded from these services uh, over and above the kind of the issues we've heard of access, just pure access, but more on the maybe the trust and culture side? Yeah, um, these are these are really essential questions. And I think in uh, defining uh, and designing their services, I think equity has to be uh, front and central. And obviously that relates to uh, disabilities, but it also relates to the fact that many services are designed for a particular kind of sociodemographic group. And if you're not part of that sociodemographic group uh, or even demographics, uh, then quite often the citizen, uh, the, the service is, um, uh, is poorly designed uh, to meet your needs. And that's in a part a result of actually the lack of input and the lack of data. Uh, I mean, there, uh, if you are using data and collective input to design services, you always have to anticipate a group that is invisible uh, mm -hmm. because of the lack of data that you have. And uh, those invisibles quite often are the ones that actually need uh, the services the most. And so from my point of view, I think as we are designing services, we really have to think about who are we ignoring in actually uh, asking input or ignoring in the data set. And that could be even at the level of gender. Uh, meaning, as we all know, uh, many services are designed with a, uh, a typical well, uh, male, middle-aged person in mind. Uh, but uh, uh, if you're female, you have different needs. Uh, I mean, we did, for instance, an analysis in Santiago de Chile, where we used mobile phone data to just understand whether women are traveling differently than men and whether that has an implication in how you actually provide public transportation mm -hmm. services. It turns out there is massive differences in how gender uh, plays a role in mobility and then that's something you should anticipate in designing services which quite often is not anticipated. So equity should be center and it should be uh, a, a key element in actually the data you're using to inform your uh, uh, design. Stefan, I, I, as the woman on the panel, I can definitely back up yeah. the sense that <laughs> women get overlooked yeah. in a lot of these decisions. <laughs> Paul, I know you're very keen, um, you've done a lot of work with different governments and agencies, in particular on kind of hard to reach vulnerable communities. So this issue of inclusion, is that something you've come across a lot? Uh, it is, um, in a lot of ways, it's, it, uh, it underpins why we're moving to a digital world. So what I mean by that is that, and I really, you know, I, I, I do think technology actually has a role in humanizing the services that we deliver. So if, if you know, increasingly citizens want to get stuff online and digital, but for those that can't or those that don't, what you're doing is you're freeing up resource so that you can work more closely with those, with those people. Now, some percentage of them may just over time, they don't trust government, they just find that it's easier and faster and they will become digital converts. Uh, but it's really the vulnerable. And what we're trying to do is free up the time and the resources of caseworkers and people that can work with them in a very human way. And to the extent that we can do more and more digital, you know, like with the veterans, um, still getting paper applications, um, automate those, digitize those, take that process from 30 days to 30 minutes to get a benefit. In addition to a faster benefit, there are 300 people that are freed up to do something else. And I, and I think they're real, I think if we spend too much time thinking about, uh, you know, we can't bring everybody along in digital, we, we really miss the point. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, absolutely. I, had, I think that's a different way of looking at it, that not only can you make the services more inclusive using digital, but you can then free up 
time, you know, really valuable resource to help those complex cases where you need to have that more kind of one on one yeah. approach, which is really important. Alex, you mentioned in your presentation the issue of accessibility and the, re the most recent reforms you've made. In terms of um, inclusion, you've already got a great take up of this one service. What do you think are the main reasons why those people who aren't yet choosing to use these services might be? Um, I think it's probably the, the reasons that we've already touched on. I mean, some people will, the, the digital propensity of the population that we have to service is vastly different. So, you know, whilst it's okay for the tech giants of the world to target people who ultimately want to use the internet and readily do, as government, we have to make sure that we can accommodate all of the, the um, users that, that require a government service. And um, people, what don't get to choose whether they use a government service or not most of the time. So it's not a, a case of choice. Do I go and use Spotify or go? do I go and use Amazon Prime or something like that? They have to choose our services. Mm. So we, it's, it's, it's the role of government to make it as easy as possible for those people to interact with those services. But, but because of the nature of the population, there are gonna be um, plenty of people out there that either can't use the internet or don't want to use the internet. And um, so we might put those, we might classify those people with assisted digital needs. And for that reason, we have to identify and provide alternative channels, um, whether that's a telephony channel or whether that's a face-to-face -face channel. I think that's gonna depend on the, the, the specific um, needs of the service and the service users. Um, yeah. But I think there are also people who may struggle to use the internet um, because of accessibility needs that we, we've already mentioned. So, you know, they're, they're predominantly either um, physical or cognitive impairments. So it's not just the obvious ones that people might think of, you know, I might be visually impaired, right? So I literally can't see what's on the screen. That's, a, that's an obvious one. But, but I think it's also about people who might struggle cognitively with a huge amount of information on a page. So it's about making sure that the, the, the user journeys remain as simple as they can be. So we have a bit of a yeah. rule of thumb, which is one thing per page. Um, you know, if, if, we're, if we're asking a question of a citizen and, and it's about one particular area, um, then we'll try and simplify that down to the very bare bones. And, and the content that we use on the service is critical. And um, the content and the use of language has to be something which is, is understandable for, for people um, who, who, you know, I, I think the mental age generally that we aim for is around about 12. If we can um, uh, align our services with a mental age of, of a 12 year old and who you might consider to be their, their kind of their, um, you know, their, their sort of reading abilities, then then you're you're generally doing quite well. And um, we also have to think about the number of users that, that, that certainly UK government will have that don't necessarily use English as a first language. And um, so they may well be using uh, built in, um, you know, sort of uh, tools within uh, web browsers, for example, to translate some of the language. Mm -hmm. so simplifying that makes sure, make, makes it much easier for that to be done and uh, with less propensity for those um, translations to be incorrect um, so I think those are the big reasons we're, we're in quite a good place I, I believe within UK government um, because of the the legislation which is, which is being brought in around the Equality Act um, and, and that supports um, some of the, the choices that we need to make in terms of um, you know making our users uh, making our services accessible Thanks. Thanks, Alex. I'm just really conscious. I said time would fly on this webinar and it really has. We've got so many questions coming in. I'm going to I'm going to put two questions together and they'll be the final two questions. So you can choose to answer one or both of these final two questions. Um, and I'm basing them again on things that have come in. So we've had a couple of questions around data and the challenge of data sharing. So a lot of these new ways of delivering services require government departments, government agencies to share data more effectively. I'd like your views on what are the challenges around that? And is there a kind of a cultural change needed to remove some silos within government departments? But also the public, are the public ready to have their data shared in that way? And somebody has asked, is there a way of making it more transparent so the public can understand how their data is being shared that might help increase trust. So that's one lot of questions around data. And the other one, which you might quickly want to talk about is, as we come out of a post COVID world, budgets are gonna be really tight. Um, are departments gonna fall back on the old ways of doing things? So I, I think it kind of relates to the silo question, or is there a real strong business case for, for bringing in these reforms? 
and working more collectively together and moving to this more digital future. So we've got about five minutes. We can overrun slightly. We've got about five minutes. So I'm going to come to you all to do kind of your thoughts on, on data, essentially, and um, the business case for carrying on going forward. I'm going to change the order a little bit. Um, Stefan, I'm going to come to you first on this one. Yeah, uh, on do we need uh, a cultural change uh, as it relates to data sharing? Uh, absolutely. Uh, meaning I always make the bad joke is that I have not met many government officials that got promoted because they shared data. Uh, uh, it's actually more the opposite, right? Hoarding data is still the, uh, uh, the, the, the default. And I think we need, do need to share that, uh, do, do need to change that. And we need to change it not by really only focusing on the data, but we need to focus on what are the questions that we seek to answer and that we cannot answer because we are holding data at the moment and having a public conversation about the questions that matter uh, that uh, uh, you should be able to answer with the data that is available and is dis uh, distributed across uh, government and others, that is the right way to step in. And it will also provide for a more public, transparent conversation about data, not by focusing on the data, but about the questions that yeah. one seeks to answer. Thanks, Stefan. I love that. Nobody's ever been promoted for sharing data. Paul, is that your experience of working with government departments and agencies? So um, my experience is if, if we have a bunch of people in a room talking about sharing a bunch of data, that's an initiative that is never going to go anywhere. Uh, my experience has been that if you can define a business, a, a problem, and the problem that is going to be solved by being able to share the data, that's a conversation that you can go to the attorneys and you can go to have a conversation about. But if, you, if, you, if it's always around, we want to do this great big data sharing initiative, it goes nowhere, 100%. Okay. And do you think trust, the public trust is an issue as well in the sharing uh, of data? Uh, yeah, so public public trust is um, is is always an issue, and you know, I'm, I'm, my data gets shared is really not my you know my mm -hmm. not my my favorite thing that I want government, especially government, to be to be well anybody to be doing. Um, on the last thing on um, post COVID world, you know, I talked early on about the importance of measuring and 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 measuring how much it costs to do something now and impact afterwards. I think we've reached a tipping point because of COVID that um, there's a there's a realization that a lot of these digitally oriented citizen services initiatives are the future and that's how we can cost effectively deliver services to citizens great thanks paul alex i'm going to come to you your thoughts on data both government department sharing the public trust or anything post-covid yeah i mean i think to a certain extent it's going to differ depending on on what country you're living in and what kind of data protection legislation exists within those countries um certainly from a uk perspective we have gdpr the general data protection regulations um and actually they they tend the starting point for that tends to be in favor of um protecting citizens uh, information so you know data sharing um whilst we'd want to share data openly and freely across government as much as we can because there are lots of benefits in doing so so um, GDPR explicitly prevents us from doing that unless there's a very clear business reason for doing so. So, you know, if, to, to the point where um, if you take tellers once as an example, um, we wouldn't ask for any information from a citizen unless we can't directly relate it back to ultimately what the service is there to do, which is about informing government that, that there's been a death and the right act so the right action needs to be taken and um, so you know we might take for example somebody's um, driving license number and the reason we would do that is because dvla uh, as a department have an interest in in making sure that they can um, update their details accordingly we wouldn't be able to ask for that driving license information if we weren't sending that information to, to dvla so, Mm -hmm. um, I think there's absolutely a benefit in, in cross-government data sharing, but clearly that's got to be within the rules of GDPR. And I think those, those, those regulations have been set up for, for good reason. Great. Thanks, Alex. Emmanuel, you, you did touch on this, I think, in your presentation. Your thoughts on our government departments getting better at sharing data? Is this a big issue and public trust as well? Yeah, thank you once more. Yes, I think... Uh, 
data sharing is, is very important. Uh, of course, the more you want to share data, the more we want to deal with the silos, it looks like this, the more we actually run deeper into the silo mentality. And so I believe we, we need to, to, to actually bring about a cultural change in that respect. Uh, the challenge, of course, uh, also comes when you look at how the public engages with government information. Uh, the more you give information, it's like you open up yourself to more criticism, uh, more negative reactions, etc. Uh, of course, there would be a, a section in, in, in society that will look at it as beneficial. But uh, I've learned that the more a government uh, opens itself up and shares. Uh, and, and there's a recent example. Uh, we've just, as a government, co uh, procured uh, 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 some uh, vaccines from India. And the way that government has been open, even the mistakes that were made during the whole process, government has been open about that. Uh, there's a challenge that says now the uh, the expiry date of the vaccines is two months. Now you need two doses of that and you can't administer them at the same time. The second dose must come six weeks after the first dose. So two months expiry date is a challenge. Now, what do you do as government? Of course, I would not say we must then keep quiet and not tell the public. Uh, solutions would come, of course, as we engage uh, some of the criticism can actually be constructive in the long run. So yes, I agree that uh, we need to, to actually deal uh, away with the silos. The government as a whole needs to work together uh, and, and share information so that we are able to address uh, challenges in service delivery. Thank you. Thanks, Emmanuel. I think really good point you make. I think lots of countries we've seen COVID has shown the public data being used in ways that they've never seen it being used before. And that's had huge benefits but also I think some governments have had to be honest about things they've had to do very quickly that maybe haven't been as successful as they would have liked so it's been a very interesting period. Larry we started with you we're going to end with you your thoughts on data management and silos and, and anything else you want to say is the closing remarks. Well, thank you um, yeah this data sharing and of course uh, GDPR and um, other similar regulations is a very 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 hot topic I think in a way we might have solved it because um, we have like a legal requirement built into the law that any government information system needs to be interoperable on one interoperability platform, which is called X Road. So it doesn't matter. You can build whatever system you want to build as long as it's able to talk to that interoperability platform. And one of the platforms that's built on that is also population registry. So whatever other government system is running, if they have legal uh, right to access the data, then technical means is always there. So, of course, they would need to justify their legal uh, needs, like uh, are they actually allowed to access that data? And also data access is always logged. So it, whoever accesses your data, there's always a trail behind that, that why did they access, who accessed, how much, etc. Mm -hmm. So it can be then queried by, in some cases, yourself, of course, but also other institutions if you, if you think there's been an abuse uh, happening. So there, is, there are solutions available. Uh, of course, it doesn't mean that people are not sort of arguing about you know, who should have access, who shouldn't. But if there is a legal requirement and if there is a legal right to access certain data, then at least the interoperability is there. So, um, so there, are, there is light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> solutions can be had. And, uh, and silos or not silos, I think in a way, uh, we really prefer systems to be distributed rather than one big monolith somewhere because uh, uh, I think Estonia was probably the first country to undergo an attack, uh, like a cyber attack by, uh, by a foreign nation state in 2007. And it really, really taught us that it's really good to have a distributed system that different units have different systems as long as they can talk to each other on some interoperability platform. So uh, that is possible. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That's a positive note to end on there, uh, but also the need for transparency sure. so people can, not, not the cyber attack, but the solutions yeah. to it, obviously, is the more positive note. We are sadly out of time. I want to say um, thank you so much. That was such a fantastic panel. It's brilliant to have had all of you, Larry, Emmanuel, Stefan, Paul and Alex, 
such a fantastic varied international panel really good to share those examples um, and compare and contrast with each other thank you also to the audience for sending in really good questions i'm sorry we couldn't quite get through all of them but i think we managed to group them together to everyone who's watching, um, if you've got colleagues who would like to see this, we will be sending a link round of the recording so you will be able to watch it back or if you want to watch it again, um, why not? And there will be a write-up of the webinar as well with some of the key points. So that will be sent round to everybody as well. Um, and I want to say a big thank you to Paul and IBM for being the knowledge partner and supporting this event today. But wherever you are, whether it's morning, afternoon or evening, whether it's snowing or whether it's hot outside, I wish you all a very lovely rest of the day and hope to see you on another one of our webinars very soon. Thank you to everybody. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.